Hi, this is Steve Wraith and thanks for listening to the Steve Wraith interviews. This interview was recorded during 2020's lockdown period and was part of a special series. I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> are you in? Where are you? Hey! Sorry about the delay, pal. <laughs> Sorry about the delay, mate. No, I'm not into going, technology, as you, pro- as you probably gathered. <laughs> How are you keeping some? You're Me good. and technology don't go together. Yeah, I'm fine, mate. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. Um, trying to trying to You're keep good. myself sane in this lockdown. Ah, oh, it's an absolute nightmare, mate. Absolute nightmare. The good thing, the good thing, I suppose, is it gives you an opportunity to do things you probably wouldn't have done. But you know, I think it's just got everyone frustrated. We've all had our ups and downs, mate, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, I've been doing more labour than I've ever done before in my life. So, you know, I've got wow. chores to last me at least till Christmas. I'm Digging my mum's patio out, I'm doing, I'm doing things I didn't actually know I could do. So it's quite enjoyable in a funny way, but um, yeah. I know I understand what it's like to work. Put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, the way this goes, mate, I'm sure you've seen a few of them anyway. We'll, we'll just do an hour's chat, um, right. and we'll get a load of questions from people. The fans get a chance to ask the questions. I'll, I'll just relay the questions to you. So, Mark right, Murphy's Paul. come straight. Mark Murphy's come straight in with one. He says, "Who's the best player that you've ever played with?" Um, we took in Newcastle, or we took in just best player overall. Go I for mean, Newcastle, I suppose. I'll, you can, you know, you can mention the other one. Yeah, I mean Newcastle is uh, it's Peter Beardsley. Uh, Newcastle, obviously, mm-hmm. we, um, I had a good understanding with Andy Cole when I was there. You know, um, you know we all know about his uh, legendary status. You know, goal, great goal scorer. But I think overall, for a player who understands, you know, unselfish, we've got to go with Peter Beardsley. Yeah. Okay, good stuff. Chris Chris Little asks, why did you why did you wear number five? That was the only one available. As simple as that. It was the only shirt available. I mean, um, Rob, I was wearing seven for a while, obviously yeah. from uh, my Norwich City days. And uh, when I came up and um, spoke spoke to Kevin and Terry McDermott, um, the only choice I think was something like number 20 something or or it's five so I thought the closest to seven was five so it, it was a bit of an accident really but obviously I did want to come into a new club and start um, kicking up a fuss about wearing a certain number yeah Fay asks uh, what's your thoughts on the takeover obviously a lot of uh, a lot of stories at the moment and um just before you answer the question, obviously another one has come out about half an hour ago that there's a Conservative MP is now going to lodge something to a committee about this and about that. It's, you know, honestly, it, it's just it's a farce, isn't it? It's 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 the media just you know clutching at straws, click, yeah. using clickbait, winding the supporters up. Yeah, it's it's just tiresome. It's tiresome. It's tiresome for me as an ex player. It's tiresome as fans. As you know, even people involved in coming, it must get a little bit. It just gets boring. I mean. The main thing for, for the players at the football club, they just want a bit of stability. They want to know what's going on with the club. But unfortunately, it just seems like a merry-go-round all the time. And, you know, if, if it ain't positive news, I'd rather they just kept it out. You know, obviously this takeover looks a little bit more positive, but you're still, you're still a little bit on edge, aren't you? You still say, well, until it's 100% confirmed, no one wants to believe anything at the moment. Yeah, I think the uh, Neil Mitchell made a great point last night. Uh, the Geordie dentist, who's obviously written a lot of stuff, uh, he lives out in Dubai, but keeps his finger on the pulse and writes a lot of things. And he was he was pretty um, pretty on the money when he said that it's because of the last twelve years of Ashley's reign where we've our our fan base has almost been brainwashed into this psych of disappointment. So yeah. they're almost expecting that they're expecting the takeover to go wrong, when ultimately. Takeovers take time. It doesn't just get. It doesn't just happen overnight, unless you do it like Mike Ashley did, which was, you know, he rushed it. He didn't do due diligence, and ended up finding an eight, an eighty million pound hole in the account. So Amanda Stadium yeah. are doing things properly, and they're, they're taking the time. And at the moment, there's no rush back, is there? Because there isn't any football. No, no, you're hundred percent right. I mean, because of Ashley Rain, and whether you you love him or, or or hate him, the the fact of the matter is, he's in the club. He's in the club, and you know, and he's run it the way he wants to run it. And unfortunately, it hasn't been to everybody's liking. Um, we, everyone would have rather have got another Sir John Hall involved. Obviously, you know, he he, he was great for the football club, but unfortunately, it's not happened. But it's just a case of. Being patient, like you said, getting the right people in who understand about the football club as well. We could get 
and new owners in who could spend billions like Man City. But if they're not going to run the club in the right way, or they're not going to play the certain football that the Newcastle fans like, it's going to be difficult to win them over just the same way. Yeah, we've got loads of questions coming in. So if anybody asks about the takeover from now on and asks what my view or your view is on what's just come out, I put yeah. this special T-shirt on. That's what I think about. <laughs> that's what I think about the stories in the papers. You should have given me a heads up. I've got one similar. You should have given me a heads up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, NUFC Miller says, who was the better forward, Cole or Ferdinand? Um. For goals and I say move, I think Cole, I think Andy Cole. I think don't forget. I think you look at the circumstances in which he arrived at Newcastle as well. I mean Les, Les, who's I played with him also at Tottenham and Newcastle, a great player. But the environment that Andy had to come into, you know, being I'd say I think he was Puff and Meridian, he's probably the second black player to come there uh, at Newcastle. Yeah. So to take to take that mantle on and also you know the the history that comes with wearing that top as well. So what he'd done over that length of time up between left, I think uh, people sometimes overlook that. You know, he, he, he had to take on a lot of pressure. So for the goals he scored and the way he played, you know, for me, he was, uh, he was a better at the two I, that I looked at. Uh, AG, but he says, what is your biggest career highlight? I mean, I know it's a cliche, but I'm quite fortunate to be able to play football, you know, from from where I've come from. So, I mean, highlights is highlights is always just being a professional, being a professional player. I, I know it's a cliche, but I'm I'm very grateful for the career I've had and some of the players like we just talked about, you know, Peter Beersy, Les Ferdinand, and David Ginola, you know, all these sort of players that you know Teddy Sherry who I've played with. So I've been I'm I'm very grateful. So the highlight really is just to be able to play professional football. It's, it's been a dream and, you know, the dream hasn't let me down. Yeah. Gaz Anderson says, what's the best match that you've played in overall throughout your career? Oof. Again, not trying to do it in a cliche. I mean, every time, I think every, every, year, every time you play at a high, high level, i.e. you play for your country, I was fortunate to play for England while I was at Newcastle. Um, also, also to play in Europe for Newcastle and also also for Norwich City so I think a highlight for me was probably Bayern Munich when we played when I was at Norwich City we played the mighty Bayern Munich and, and beat them over two legs um, and that, that I would say probably that would I mean when I first got there I think even though it doesn't look like a big game I think when we first got back into Europe for Newcastle the first European game we played Anderlecht um, I think that was a, a massive game the way we destroyed them as well you know the goals we scored and, and were and, 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 and yeah three. Yeah, you got the three-headed goals. Yeah, yeah. So that would for me, you know, just to be back in Europe for Newcastle and seeing the fans and travelling, that made that was that was that was great for me as well. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, Have a go, hero says. What did Kevin Keegan say to you when he approached you to sign you? <laughs> Apart from a contract, the um, he um. As as you know, he, he he's very infectious. You know, when, when he spoke to me, I mean, the the, the story of it is, I, I was going to training. I was going to training at um, Norwich. It, it was just a normal day for me. I'd seen some speculation about it, but it wasn't anything that was affecting me in any way because I I knew I was one of the top players at Norwich. Um, we just come off a great season, so we was looking to improve on the players. So it's just one day I was driving into training, and, and the chairman phoned me up told me that Newcastle had interested me, gave me no other choice but said, well, go and speak to him. He said, go speak to Kevin. He's in Newcastle. Go speak to him. So I'd just got up there with an overnight bag thinking I'd go speak to him, come back, you know, think about it, you know, take up my options. Um, by the time I got up there, I, I didn't actually go back to pick my gear up. That's how infectious he was. So that tells you the whole story, you know. He took, he took me to the hotel, locked me in the hotel and said to me, any time, if you need any gear, we'll go and get it. He didn't want me to go back to change my mind. So apart from that, he, he, he's, he's football. You know, he's a legend. So he talks passionately about Newcastle. He talked about where he wants to take the club, about, you know, about the fans. About He also talked to me on, on, on a personal note about the same thing I mentioned about being a black player to be successful at Newcastle. Um that that was one of the things that he, he stole for me because I, I knew at the time I'm, I'm not going to try and sugarcoat it over it wasn't a place where black players went uh, when I first yeah. started off playing football you know we're, we're all honest about that it was one there was I probably was more nervous about going and playing for 
I remember a few times I played there, it, it, it was very intimidating. So for me to go there, it wasn't a kind of thing that I would be thinking it's an ideal place for me to go and my family. But, you know, he gave me a challenge. He said, you know, if you're successful, it, it'll open up the gates. It, it also educates the fans. And, and it did. He, he was 100% right. So, you know, to break it down, he, he just sold the club in the right way to me. Fantastic. NUFC Fire and Skill says he, uh, he was the first million pound man at Newcastle. What a great little player. He asks if you're still five foot six. <laughs> <laughs> you know what they say, the older you get your shrink, so I think I'm about five foot four now. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Murphy says, if you were playing today, which manager would you like to play for? Um, Klopp. Everyone's favourite. He's, he's got that same infectious thing about him. He, he, he's got... Um, what I would call um, people skills. He knows about individuals. He knows how to get the best out of players. You know, he's got his arm around players. Kevin King and the team at Dermot were, were similar, were, were just like that. So I can see the slight resemblance in, 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 in Klopp. So out of all the managers, I know Pep Guardiola is a very good manager. He seems very intense to me, but he knows, how to, again, how to get the best out of players. But if I had to choose out of them both, I think I, think I would probably go with, go with Klopp. Uh, Craig Morrison asking, what was Glenn Hoddle like as a player manager? I didn't play with under Glenn. I didn't play under Glenn, Is unfortunately, it? did I? No, no. When they talk about Newcastle. I'm not sure Glenn Hoddle, am. was he not at Tottenham when you were there? No, no. I was under Jerry Jerry Francis when I, when I left Newcastle to go to Tottenham. And then they went through quite a few managers. Chris Hewton was a manager for a little while, didn't they? Um, then obviously... Um, no, no, Glenn Holder wasn't around. I think it was just before. He was just before. That, that answers the question then for Craig. And <laughs> Mark, 88, says, who was your best mate at Newcastle? Do you know what? We, we had a great team spirit. Again, part, part of what Keegan introduced into the squad. I mean, I got on well with Andy Cole because uh, obviously we were both from, from, um, from South, so it was easy for us to get on travelling back and forth together. Um, obviously, Nash and E. Clark. With the the the, the journeys that looked after the clubs, Steve Watson, even <laughs> Steve, Hatt. oh, they were brilliant. So for me, we we were we stuck around like a little group. We were always around together. But then all, all the players, you know, Philip Albert, not said even when David Ginola was there, everyone would not not you know, it was a family club, you know, family clubs. There weren't yeah. really any segregation. So I I like to say I really got I I couldn't really choose anyone only because I was around Andy because we both were up there on our own. We spent a lot of time together, but all the players were, were brilliant. We're just like a, a, a big family there. Yeah. The future KGP says, what was Kevin Keegan's man management like? Oh, superb. Superb. You know, like, like I um, spoke about earlier, he knew he knew which players needed, I would say, a, a kick up the backside sometimes. And he knew which player had, he had to put an arm around. There was so, there was so many, I think what he'd done, he, he, he wasn't too embarrassed about learning from his mistakes. I think just before I came there, I think there was a situation with um, Andy Cole was living in some village, weren't he? Where was it? Canic or something? Uh, some, Crook. Crook, that's it. Crook, he was living there. And there, there, was, there was stories about him having problems settling in and bits and pieces like that. So from there, when, he, when I first came there, he couldn't do any better for me. You know, anytime my family or friends wanted to come up, he would put me up in a gossy hotel to stay over. I couldn't get rid of him a lot of the times with family because he'd, he'd, he'd just let anyone come up and stay. And also, he knew when I needed a break, he'd send me back home and say, you know, don't come in training for a few days. I've got to send you home and see your family. So his man management skills were brilliant because then that made you want to run through brick walls for him. So he was very clever at it. But at the same time, it was part of his great management skills. Yeah. Mark Murphy says, which team did you hate playing against? Oh... Teams always beat us, so there's quite a few. You know, I didn't like losing to me, to be honest with you. I mean, um, there was teams like your Wimbledon's and all that who, who, who were slightly different, but I wouldn't say I, I, I didn't really look forward to playing because the whole thing was going out there and playing yourself up against the best. You know, I enjoyed playing against Man United. I got frustrated that we, you know, never got one over on a regular basis because you know you you want to test yourself against the best. But generally, I mean, there, were, there wasn't a team that. I, I looked at for, oh, God's sake, I can't believe we're, we're playing against them. Obviously, you know, depending on what time of year it is. If you're getting a team like, like, like I mentioned, like your women, and it's a cold, frosty night and you, you've got elbows flying at you and, you know, the ball doesn't really stay on the ground, 
that could have that wasn't very enjoyable. So on them circumstances, probably with Wimbledon, I would say I didn't really enjoy playing against. Yeah, uh, crowds eighteen says, "Who's the best player that you've played against?" Uh, best player I played against. I mean, because I played on a right majority of times, it would have to be left side player. So Dennis Irwin was a very good player. I found it hard to play against him because he was very clever. You know, he, he's one of the ones who, when you look at, he doesn't look like he's that threatening, but he was he could play left foot, right foot. And he, he, he was also like, similar to a player we had at um, Norwich called Mark Bowen. He could play either side. He could play with his right foot or left foot. So when you're a winger, sometimes you want to run on their weaker side or you try a bit for pace, but he read the game very well. So I found him probably the most difficult player to probably outmaneuver. And then you got your you got your your other players like your Stuart Pierces who who were quite intimidating just to look at in the first place. But um, I would say Dennis Irwin was probably one of our most difficult opponents. Yeah. Uh, Umar Online, question up there. Would you have Rafa back as manager at Newcastle if the takeover goes through? Um, I I wouldn't be down to me. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think he'd done very well. He understands the club. The club love him. And I think, you know, for him to drop down the division and decide to stay with, you know, with the history that he's got, um, it shows that he actually does care for the club. Um, I, 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 I personally wouldn't frown at it because if you look around at other managers now, where, where, where are you going to find a manager with his experience and quality? You know, so if it's a case of, unless seeing any other managers that that would put this out forward, I, I, I would be against, I would be against him coming back. Okay, Dan Deva, he comes in with his usual question, which is, if you ha- if you could take three guests to a dinner party, who would they be? Guest? I don't know. Um, it could be anybody. Oh, I can't say. I wouldn't know, actually. It'd be, it'd be footballers I probably haven't met. It'd probably be uh, the phenomenal Ronaldo, not not the not the one who's, who's still playing now, the Brazilian Ronaldo. If you want to be the Brazilians, I'd like to meet Pelé. Um... Probably, I don't know, who else would I probably like to meet? Probably Denzel Washington. That'd be a mix, wouldn't it? Yeah, good <laughs> mix. for movies, because I like, I like <laughs> movies, and I like him in movies. So, yeah, just to get some knowledge off him, because he, he's a very knowledgeable guy. I, like, I, like, I love him. Excellent. This one follows on, really, I suppose. Mark Robbo's question, which, which is the best player that you wish you could have played with? Oh, Without being too disrespectful for any players, I've been quite I've been quite fortunate, like I said before. You know, I've had I'm, I'm a midfield player, so I've played with some really good midfield players: Rob Lee, Darren Anderton. I've I've played with uh, uh, good strikers: Les Ferdinand, um, Ginola on the left side, Scott Sallers. I really love playing with Scott Sallers. Um, then you got Andy Cole, Kenny Sherwood. Well, I don't know. I mean, if I had to choose anyone else apart from that, I mean. It'd probably be someone like, I don't know, like Ryan Giggs. Right, probably mm-hmm. Ryan Giggs but, or, or Eric Cantona. Probably yeah. Eric Cantona, if you look at the dude, because again, he looked like he looked like a, a Peter Beardsley type who didn't mind taking on the pressure, you know, and he, you know, the team was built around him. So probably, probably Eric Cantona. Yeah, good stuff. Mark Dill says, uh, was Malcolm Allen as bonkers as he seemed? <laughs> no, no, he's worse. He was crazy. <laughs> no, you know, you know, you're very as well, Steve. Some of this, a lot of the stories yeah. you can't you can't say because he, he was yeah. crazy. I was fortunate enough to actually get a taste of him because he was at um, Norwich when I was there. So he was there at Norwich yeah. for a brief while. He, I think he came from Watford then with Tim Sherd, and he came and he, he was crazy then. You know, he, 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 but he, he was one of the ones you needed in the change rooms. You know, he he crossed the line quite a lot, but a lot of the stuff is funny. But if you if you take that aside, the talent, the, it, it was unfortunate that he, he, you know, with his knee injuries, that he couldn't probably perform at 100 percent for more for more. You know, I don't think he actually got too long playing 100 percent. You know, he's always carried injuries, but the talent he had, you know, he was a great player to play with. You know, very skillful. Um, but yeah, he he he, he, he was he's very entertaining. Put it that way. Yeah. Chris Little says, do you think Kevin Keegan could still do a managerial job in today's game? Um, I think he could, but I think it'd be very difficult. Football's moved on quite a lot, but at the same time, it hasn't moved on a lot from his beliefs. 
you know, he was about the Liverpool way, playing football, you know, moving the ball a lot. So it's not a lot different. So to adjust to the way the football is being played, no, I don't think that'd be a problem for him. I think the only problem will be is getting the players to fit into that system and also being able to being able to get the, the sort of players in who would play to that sort of system, you know, like it's today. You know, it'd be very hard to like he done before was to find some talent from lower leagues and, and put them straight into the premiership. It's it's very hard, you know, you've got to have a, a lot of money, you know, to, to buy the talent and also to to fit into your system and, and the team. So I think Kevin Keegan yeah. would do a good job but finance would play would play a big key. Yeah. Mr. Mini Jeep says, what was your favourite strip to play in while you were at Newcastle? I love the home strip. I, I mean, the black and white stripes. I, I love the home strip. I, I wasn't, I didn't mind that we, I think we bought the blue strip out at one time, didn't we? And we had yeah, the, the did, blue yeah. strip. I didn't mind that one either, but I mean, obviously my favourite's the, 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 the black and white. You know, it, it, yeah. it, it, it comes with a bit of history. So, it, you know, it, it gave you that lift when you put the shirt on just before running out. Yeah. AJB says, who were your football and idols growing up? Um, I had quite a few. I mean, if I was going back from when I first started, it was Laurie Cunningham, Cyril Regis. Um, then as I was getting older, John Barnes. Um, there's, there's quite a few. Mark Walls, I, I was supporting Man United, so I, I liked Stevie Koppel, where it was at Man, Man United, the little winger. Um, yeah, I mean, Ian Wright is also. So there's quite a few. I think you 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 as you get older and you start understanding more about football, you understand about what the players, what they've had to do to get to a certain stage. I think you 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 have them same top players, but you kind of shift them between top one, two, three, four. So I like to put them all in the same category. So all the players I named off, they had, they were they were idols of mine. Yeah. Andy Garbett says, what does Rule think of the current Newcastle United team? It's, it, we, we were just saying about you know, managers coming in and having a mixture of players, and that's what he's got. He's got a mixture of, of players who unfortunately haven't got a run together enough to actually get any consistency going. Um, they've always been kind of stuck in that, you know, I think they got halfway at one time. But unfortunately, because of injuries, through lack of form, through players... Uh, I think you've got Amaran who, who just before this break was starting to, I think he was just starting to get a feel of, of, of what it was, what was expected of him to play. Um, you know, you've got Joe Linton who, who, who's come in and struggled. Usually with Newcastle, like, like, like you've seen when I was playing, players would come in and because they were coming to a, a, a good, confident environment, I can remember when I came in, it, 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 just, it just became natural. I think players who are coming to the club now with all the confusion going with the owners and, and the team not playing consistently, it's hard to, to get a run a run of games going where you're winning consistently. So your type of football that you want to play takes a back seat because you're almost playing defensive-minded. So it, it's, very, it's very difficult. Yeah. Um, Ad says, if you were director of football, what position and what player would you buy first? For the current Newcastle team? Yeah. It's difficult, isn't it? Because I think I think I think the, the, the backbone is very important in the team. So I mean unfortunately no no slight on, on Jolly Little. You we need a need a strike who's gonna put their chances away. Because because like you know, you, you we've been quite blessed with strikers over the years at Newcastle. We're talking we talk. We have we have strikers of probably one in two, one in three, you know, who scores. You know, every two chances they're going to score. If you haven't got that, all the work that you're putting in place and the systems you're putting up is geared to to score goals. So if, if the system's wrong or the player's not quite got his form, it's going to affect you. You need a player who's going to come in and 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 take that responsibility on board and say, Do you know what, give me the ball. I want to score goals. You know, and unfortunately, yeah. I don't, I, 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 can't comment on what's going on there. But it looks like he has struggled slightly with his confidence. Yeah, uh, MJ Winster says, "Who would, who would be a dream fullback um, playing behind you when you were playing? Would it be Irwin? Because I mean, he was your toughest opponent." Yeah, yeah, it'd probably be Dennis Irwin. I mean, uh, every right back I've played, I've had a good, I've, I've had a good connection with. I think from. Uh, Ian Culverass at Norwich I had a great connection with him and then when I come to Newcastle I had uh, Hottager um, 
hot teacher, yeah. and then and then Watto, slightly slightly different both of them, but they like to get forward and we like to get back together. So I think when you got that combination with players, I think they all were great for me. They all were great for me, but like you said. Because I, you're right. Because Dennis Irwin was probably the most difficult. It would probably be I would have liked to have known if I could have a have a bit of a connection with him playing. Dennis Irwin, yeah. Yeah, Dan Daver and a few others are asking about the article again that should come up in the Chronicle. That's why I've got the T-shirt on. That's what I think <laughs> that story. The future KGP says best player in the Premier League right now. Best player for me. The one I, I really like watching and, and seeing the smile on his face, just like we were doing at Duca, is Firmino at, at, um, at uh, Liverpool. Yeah. Plays up front. yeah, just always got a smile on his face and some of the things that he pulls off, you know, and I think for really coming from a German league, everyone weren't too sure about it, but, you know, certainly but surely over those two seasons, I don't, Liverpool ain't the same team without him in it. You know, they're a good yeah. functional team, but you could tell without him in it, he brings that flair, you know, and he's putting, he's starting to get a few goals as well. So I, I do like him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good shout. Jordy Vinyl says, great crack, lad. Sorry, I've got to get back to me paint. And Mrs. H is glaring at me and stamping his foot like a woman from the top. <laughs> <laughs> I understand his pain. I understand his pain. I've got to get back to me patio as soon as this done. The mum's been looking at me all day. Uh, Andy Mark says, can you see anybody beating Alan Shearer's Premier League goal tally? And if so, who? No. Simple answer, no. I guess, you know what I mean? There's been some great players. You know, you you, you got Cole, you got Ian Wright, Les Ferdinand. They're all trying to get turned to Teddy Sheringham. them. All these great strikers who, who not, we just said, one and two players, they, they were prolific. But for the league we was in, you look at Alan's injuries as well, he probably would be more goals. So we're quite, mm -hmm. for, we're quite fortunate that the goal tally didn't go any further. I don't, I, ca I can't see. I mean, if Ronaldo was still playing here, um, may, maybe someone like Ronaldo could probably have got closer, but I can't Harry see. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it depends, it depends how, how, the, how the Tottenham team progress. As, as you know, you, I don't think you can keep carrying the team like he has been doing. Yeah. Alan was very lucky. The team was geared to him and he had he had always had great players around him. So, you know, the thing about, like I said, Harry Kane, great player, but you could see it, it, with these injuries last year, it's starting to take its toll with the energy levels, you know, having to produce it for England, then going having to produce it for Tottenham. It's slightly, it, 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 it's, a, it's a big arc for you. I, I, even though he's doing very well, I still don't, you know, that means he's got to be hitting what we're talking about. We're talking about 30 plus a season. Every, yeah. every for, the, for the next, for the next, what, five, six years? I don't know. It's it, like you said, it's a big ask and I uh, wish me best, but I, 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 me personally, I don't think anyone would catch it. Yeah. Glenn 1987 says, what does rule make of Alan St. Maximum? He's been a winger after, you know, you were a winger yourself back in the day. What do you make of him? He's another player like the Amaro, like I said. You can see he's slowly starting to come into his own. I think, I don't think anyone took him too serious when he first came. They thought he's just a bag of tricks, no end product. But I feel like if he has the right manager under, under him, I've, uh, he, like he was towards the end of the season, he, he was becoming a great asset, weren't he? He was becoming a, the go to yeah. guy. I think if hopefully he could carry that four mile, I, I think he could be anything he wants. He could probably end up being, being a striker or playing just behind the strike. I think he's got more to him than just playing out wide. I think he's, he's he's got a lot more to his game, but it's down to the manager whether they try and find a, a place in the team where they get the best out of him. And I think towards the end of the season, they were getting the best out of him. Johnny Heal says, which away grounds were your favourite and least favourite to play at and why? Um, strangely enough, when I was at Newcastle, I used to like playing at Tottenham because there was a thing about Tottenham. No one really, until I went there, I didn't realise that. Even though they're, they're a great team and all that, players always said, oh, I love playing there because they got the most stick there from a Tottenham fan. So I used to like playing at White Hart Lane uh, because of the banter. Uh, Manchester United, for obvious reasons, because I was a fan of uh, Manchester United and, 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 and the surface and the ground and the history. So I, I love playing there as well. So I think them two grounds, and obviously when you're playing in the derbies, I wasn't fortunate enough to play in, in uh, Sunderland against Sunderland, but I played at Middlesbrough 
and we won there, so I enjoyed that. Any derby, if you go in a derby, you play at the way ground and win. It's the best. It's the best feeling ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good stuff. And what was your? What was? Which grounds did you not like to play at? Um, same ones as I said before with the teams. Wimbledon didn't really like playing there. Um, back in the old days, it was um, the Den was Millwall's ground. They had the cage yeah. and it was really close, really close. So you could hear and feel everything that they were saying to you. And at them times, it wasn't very pleasant playing at them grounds as a black player. So I would say the old dead, the old dead uh, and, and, and play with like Wimbledon weren't the nicest grounds to play at. Yeah. Finnaz says, why did you leave Newcastle? Um, it, it, again, it was one of the ones, it was, it was quite a strange one. I, I knew that, I knew that Tottenham were interested in me, but again, I was only at Newcastle for like coming up with my second season. It wasn't, and I, was, I was definitely not looking to leave. Um, and I understand, like with the Andy Cole thing, Kevin was looking to invest in players. He was he was looking further ahead, and it just so happens that my day got mentioned, and, and obviously the money that was being offered to him, they couldn't turn it down. So he he approached me and, and said to me, I replied to him and said I was under contract. I was happy to to stay. I was more than happy to stay, but then it got to a stage where it it was either it was either my side of it where I wasn't getting in the team as regular as I wanted to get into the team, or it was his way of saying, you know, if I give him less games, then it would force his hand to leave. I don't I don't really know what happened. I do know it was a bit it was a massive disappointment for me because I was I could see where the team was going. I, you know, I loved it there. I was settled in Newcastle. I loved living there, so I had no reason. I wasn't homesick. Even though my family were living down here, I was, I was happy commuting and you know at weekends and stuff and going back home. So there was no way I was using that as an excuse because um, I I loved it in Newcastle. It was just unfortunate it got to a stage where I'd come off a good season. I think I scored about fourteen goals or something like that. And then the following season, I found myself in competition with Keith Gillespie. No 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 disappointment with that. You know I was happy to at one time I think when he first came. It was I was playing on one side. He was uh, then we had Janola came in, so it was just out of me and Keith who were playing, and I understand that, I understand that totally. But for me, it was it was hard to get my head around because I'd had a good season the season before that, and I felt that you know the run I was on it got halted. So it almost forced my way to to say, well, if, you know, if I feel I'm not wanted here on a regular basis, then I would leave. So, but it, I did leave being happy with leaving. I left because I wanted to carry on playing football. Yeah. Davey G asks, if you were still playing today, would you be behind Project Restart? We've seen Danny Rose come out amongst the Newcastle team and be quite, you know, vociferous against it, saying that, you know, we shouldn't be going back to football until the death rate falls considerably in the country. So what would your view be, do you think, as a footballer? I, 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 I agree with it. I agree with it. I mean, the only way you can, you can um, do this is to pipe play behind closed doors and it's not really fair on the fans you know you've got season ticket holders who, who, are, who are missing out on games you know it, it shouldn't be a financial um, situation where you're only playing because of the finals because Sky are putting pressure on you because the league are putting pressure on you you know it's all about people's safeties you know and like you said this thing this disease is, is a horrible disease you don't know you're carrying it at times and, until, until, until you hit rock bottom so you know we could be as Safe as we can, we can come to training. We can, you can train, you can play matches, but there's gonna be there's gonna be contact. You know, there's gonna be contact between you and other players, and you know, there's there's you're gonna have to have staff there who clean and do stuff. But I I, I would go with Danny Rose. So I said, I, I, it's, it, you know, you gotta be you gotta be more safe conscious and just think <coughs> this is more this is more important than, than football. So make sure everyone's safe. So I would be against coming back until until we get to a stage where the normal working people and uh, normal life gets back to normal where you feel safe walking around the streets and doing the normal things before you even think about having gatherings and watching football at big stadiums and you know players going back and you know playing football and having showers and you know baths and in the same places it's it's too much at risk so I would I would make sure it's 100% before I went back so I would be comfortable going back in this time 
It's interesting you say that. I mean, I heard John Cross, the journalist, this morning from the Daily Mirror on uh, Good Morning Britain. They were debating uh, whether they should do this. And he was of the uh, of the opinion that it should, you know, again, restart once once it's safe. But, I mean, uh, Piers Morgan, I know he's not everyone's cup of tea, was saying that the season should just be mothballed until, you know, until, you know, we, we are back to, to what we would call normal. So there seems to be more people going towards that than there does, you know, starting starting the season again. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah. Meetings again. Weekend, I think, well, yeah, you know, it's, think, it's horrible, it. isn't it? It's, it's horrible yeah, because, it like you said, you got to think about it. you feel sorry for the most people you feel sorry for is, is, is the teams like Tottenham, Liverpool for the season they've had, and they've been so entertaining for, for we all agree for all of us, they've been great to watch, yeah. you know, in Europe. And that. so, for that to be halted now, then they the only way they can resolve that is by whatever position you're in now, they'll say, Well, that's your finishing position, but again, you've got the counter argument of the teams who are down the bottom who. Who probably would want the season to finish? Be, be, oh, sorry, would want the season to finish because they don't want to be relegated. So it all depends what punishment is going to be because, you know, financially for any team, say the team are in the bottom three now, they would be happy for it to be stopped now and start again because they will get another season, a Premiership. Where if you go by where they are and it just happens like the season's finished now, then them three teams at the bottom will get relegated and they'll probably think, well. It's not fair that Liverpool should then be crowned as champions because they haven't finished the season because it's not mathematically right. So it's, it's so difficult. So the better thing, like you said, is to let this let this disease get out of the way, let it rise, let everyone have get back to normal life, and then re, re, reassess it. Then. Yeah, Mark Murphy says, "Have you ever had any regrets in your about in your career?" Um. People always say no regrets and all that, and I think they're sitting on the fence when I say. And like I told you, I, I, even though I enjoyed myself at Tottenham, I, had a, uh, I spent a lot of time there, and, and it was great there. I, I, I wish I would have stayed at, at, well, been able to have the choice to to stay at Newcastle for for longer. Yeah, uh, Brian Parkin says, was Andy Cole easy to read as a centre forward in terms of runs and what he was thinking? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think you, like I said to you, you get to that. You sometimes you get a player who's on the same wavelength as you, and football's quite simple when you've got someone who's got the same wavelength. You know, it's like playing with Andy Carroll. You know what you know what you got. You know what his strengths are. His strengths are in the air. They might overdo it sometimes, but with Andy Carroll, I knew I knew as soon as I as soon as I had my first, as soon as I looked forward, he was already making moves. Same with Peter Beardsley, easy to read. You know, he, he he's and that's why he was such a success at Man United. Once they got used to his movement, his movement is fantastic. You know, it, and his first touch is good, especially when he's around the box. So when you got used to him, it didn't take me long to get on the same wavelength for him. So no, it's not difficult. Yeah, old grey nineteen says, "What do you miss least about professional football?" <laughs> that's my mate Darren Alper from the. Um, Old grey, he's, he's, he's one of my boot right. members. <laughs> um, yeah. what, do you... um, what do I, what do I, what was the question? Miss... Sorry? Um, pre-season. <laughs> 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 Running around. But saying that though, Newcastle pre-season was, was quite nice because we, we done everything with the football. It was the other clubs mm-hmm. we was at where we just ran and ran and ran all the time. But, um, People were telling you we hardly done any running. If we did, we we we'd, we'd fake an injury, so we have to go in the treatment room and not do the running. Andy Cole, I can't remember Andy Cole doing too much running, but on the pitch he scored goals, so it proves the point, you know. Um, pre-season was always tough, but at the same time, you knew it's something that you needed. Yeah, Mark Murphy's question on the screen there: If you could say anything to make Ashley, what would it be? Um, probably like anyone else, just sell up, but. It's, and like, like we know, it's, it's easier said than done. And we don't know what's going on in the background. He's a business guy. He wants to get the best deal he can out of it. So, really, it's, it's just, it's just, um, let's get this conclude, it's concluded as soon as we can. Yeah, uh, Mark says, is Rule going to raise a can or two if the takeover goes through? If so, what? Obviously, I'm not sure whether you've you've seen this, but Newcastle fans have. I've got a new, a new hashtag on Twitter, which is hashtag cans. And, and of course, it's all about cans that will be drunk once the takeover goes through. So have you got a particular tipple rule? Oh, I'm starting to get into my ales now. Um, I like ales to a fellow. So 
New, Newcastle Brown Ale, they do that, don't they? So I'll, 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 yeah, keep yeah. With, I'll keep with the Newcastle theme and I'll say a, a Newcastle Brown Ale, even though they're in bottles, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. Get them in, I think you can get them in cans. Um, oh, okay. Steve Bruce is still, you know, still manager at the moment. Um, well, say manager, coach, head coach. It's the new terminology they use these days. Um, do you think, you know, do you think Steve Bruce would stay on if, you know, the takeover goes through and they do appoint a new manager? Do you think you would? Do you think you would see him stay, or do you think he would be too proud and probably move on? It depends on what capacity. I think, I think, I think, towards this end of the season, I, I think he was he was winning over a lot of doubters. You know, it started out because I know him very well, obviously from from my Norwich days. Again, he was my captain when I was at Norwich. I also know Steve Clemens from Tottenham. Both lovely mm-hmm. guys. You know, you know, not got a bad word to say about them. They're they're really, really hundred percent love football. Really nice guy. Um, the problem they had was taken over at, at Newcastle because of what was going on. There was nothing. It was no slight against either of them. You know, I think in division their, their records suggest that they're, they're they're good coaches and good managers. Um, but I think again, like you said, you know, he, his heartstrings are won over because you know when he got offered a job with his Newcastle connections, you could understand who coming over, even though he, it started difficult. But I think he was finishing, finishing quite. I would say strong, but he, he was starting to. The players were starting to adjust to what he wanted. They were understanding what it's, what it's about being at Newcastle. So I don't think if there was a takeover, they offered him say like. A backroom job, I'm not too sure whether he'd take it. That'd be down to him, you know, because I think he's too proud for that, you know. So I, I wouldn't have, me knowing him, but not, not getting inside his head, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have guessed that he would want to stay on unless he was still manager. I mean, look, was it, it, it's often reported he was a Newcastle fan. Was he a Newcastle fan? He's a Newcastle lad, or was he? You, you're a Man U uh, fan. Was was he a Newcastle uh, fan? I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure. I, you know, it could like, like like usually you hear about it when they're players. They talk about you know your yeah, favourite yeah, clubs. Yeah. It never came out too much. I, well, you know, I wasn't looking out for it. But I don't know about yourself, but I never really heard him talk, talking about no, Newcastle. I mean, I, I, you know, when yeah. you hear about things, when someone said to me, you know, said to me, I'll say, yeah, yeah, I was you know Man United fan. You know, and then you got your second team. So the, I don't. Maybe the question wasn't ever asked to him. You know, because managers don't like to be asked who their favourite teams are, but. As a player, he yeah. thought that maybe, maybe it was Man United because you know he, he went there from from Norwich, and maybe it might have been there. I don't, I'm not too sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's an interesting question. And uh, Nicole Bridges asks a really important one as well. What was your favourite pub or club? Was it Julie's? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I slept there a few times as well. It was funny, Julie's. It was a good hangout for the boys. I mean, I can't say there's too many places that we could name, weren't it? I mean, it is. I mean, favorite restaurant, who knows? <laughs> who knows? Yeah, who knows? Same place, like I said, because we went round as a team. We we went to the same place, so we 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 felt safe there. And I mean, every time I go back there, I I used to always look out for who knows, you know. And it, it, it's it's got a fun it's fun memories for me, fun memories for me, both places, Julie's and Una. Yeah, Mark Murphy says, do you think Steve Bruce would be able to attract big name players if he stayed as manager? Yeah. I, I, Again, it's a difficult one. It's down to individuals. You know what I mean? There's a lot of there's a lot of players there who who, who, who who have got their favourite teams, and some some when you're looking at the certain quality of players, it's changed now. There was players who used to like like we just mentioned Andy Cole. We got Peter Beersy. There were some players who would come and they could see the bigger picture, but there's some players who want to come straight and they want to come into a team that's fighting for for trophies. So you're gonna yeah. have to be quite a convincing manager to get these types of players in. I mean. I think he, he can attract some good quality players in the Premiership, but when it comes to maybe abroad, I'm not too sure, you know. But, you know, if, if they see new owners come in and they can see the bigger picture, like I told you when I first went to Newcastle, if you could sell, if you can, if you sell the, the team to them, where you go with them, you know, I don't see why not. Why, why not? But it's gonna, it would be very difficult because of the position that Newcastle are in at the moment. Yeah, Eddie Amiobi says, "Which player you uh, you played with at Newcastle do you think would still be effective in today's Newcastle team?" Oh, Newcastle team. Um, a retired player. You're talking about? Talking yeah, about, uh, which player, player, who, do be, think, it, who do you think would still be in the Premier League? Rob Lee for definite. Rob Lee for definite. Um, uh, Philip Albert definitely. 
Philip be over there. Well, they're all the old players. So I'll be, I'll, I'll be biased to say most of Newcastle players and David Ginola as well. I like to say most of the players would, would, would fit into to most premiership top teams. The ones I just named would definitely fit into the top, t- top, top tier teams. Yeah. Andy Mark says, who was the best youth player that you saw at Newcastle? Um, when you were there. We had quite a few, actually. I'm trying to think if I remember. There was one called... Oh, Chris, Chrissy, Chrissy Holland? Is that Chrissy Holland? Yeah, Chris. We used to call yeah, him Barton. He, he, he was just getting to the team just before I left. He yeah, was just, I, right, I don't yeah. know if they got for the youth player. They had one called... Um, oh, God. I'm not I'm bad with names. I don't know if it's Crowley or Crouchy or something like that. They, right. Alan, Alan something, because he used to be one of the apprentices. He, he went on, I think, to play at the Doncaster and a few other clubs. Um, yeah, but yeah, Holland's the young player. Yeah, Hot Chris Island was a good player, very good, talented player. I liked him a lot as well. Something happened to him. I can't remember what it was. I'm sure he got some kind of injury, or he got. To, I can't yeah. remember. Something that, yeah, yeah, you know, that's he did, what I remember. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tom Dixon says, "What was your worst injury at Newcastle? Did you have one?" No, I just got the genuine one for people with pace. I got um, hamstring injuries. I never. I was quite lucky. Touch with it. It was mainly hamstrings. So I'd, I'd be out for, I can't remember what I was out for, I, want, I wouldn't have been injured for more than Newcastle. I think when we, I think we, the, the injury I got, which really kind of, kind of happened at the wrong time, I think we played Atletico Madrid in the, when we got to Europe. I think, yeah. I, what's that, the first leg or second, the first leg, and I played with a hamstring injury then, I wish I'd never played then. Um, I think he was like sad to me that the players need me. You know, again that speech he gives about you know we, we need you in the team even if you're sixty percent fit. And I went out there and my heart ruled over it and I and I played with a hamstring then. And straight after that, I I said to myself I'm not going to do it again. So I think I after that game I was injured for maybe four four weeks something like that. But yeah, so hamstring injuries probably the worst hamstring injuries I got. Yeah, uh, a lot of uh, cheers to Squint and A. Mason. I, I knew there was something like that, and I didn't want to see it in case I was wrong. But yeah, he was sprayed in the eyes with ammonia, um, Holland. Oh yes, yes, yeah, yeah, bloody poor, play, poor guy. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Andy Mark and, and a couple of others asking, do you still keep in contact with any of the ex-players? You, you're a pretty tight bunch, aren't you, from that era? Yeah, yeah. As you know, Steve, we have get-togethers. We are, we have. You know, charity guys, we have get togethers, we have tour kids and all that. So, yeah, so we keep in touch quite a lot. I mean, I speak to John Berris quite a two times. You know, I speak to him, Rob Lee, I still speak to, you know, you know, it's like we, we again, because of the way we joined, it's, it's quite rare that when players leave clubs that they, you know, keep in touch quite regular. But there's one, um, the one good thing is that Newcastle players, and sorry, Newcastle and Norwich, they're the two teams that, a majority of the players we still keep in touch together yeah 100% uh, Tom Dixon says do you still um, do you miss playing football uh, do you play five a side do you keep do you, you, well let's talk about it we've got about four or five minutes left you do yeah. keep fit do you, you run your own boot camps rule down in um, down in your part of the world yeah yeah I'm quite fortunate because I run I run I've been running the boot camps down here now for tw- 12 no, so 11 come 12 years so I've been quite fortunate that it it actually puts me in a position where I have to be fit. I don't think I'll be, I don't think I'll be um, getting many clients if I turn up with a with, with a with a big gut <laughs> and a fag in my mouth. So uh, it's it's quite it puts me in a position where I have to keep fit. But at the same time, I do enjoy it. Uh, so I run boot camps there. So yeah, I, I, I mean, fitness. What was the question again? Sorry, mate. I got off key then. Well, just just literally about five a side and stuff. I mean, so you, you obviously don't play I, football. I mean, yeah, play I could fans. play that. Yeah, I, I I play now, but obviously it's it's the after effects. I mean, you know what it's like. You you put the boots on, and I still think I could I could sprint past people and stuff, and I get a quick reminder the next day. And it felt, feels like I've been knocked over by a lorry, but um, I mean, I could I I'm I'm, I'm very I'm a very fit person for my age, but um, five a sides is probably. I would say the the place where I probably feel comfortable because you haven't got to run too far. But playing on a full size pitch, uh, it would probably start well, but it would end end badly probably. Dan Gray says you still look fit enough to put a shift in on a Saturday. <laughs> That's what I mean. Appearances are false. Don't don't believe in the appearances. I mean, like I just said, um, I, I I feel fit. 
I, I, I probably look a little bit younger than I am, but it's it's you know it, it, it's it's surprising how much it takes out of you because especially in my position, my position weren't about you know just reading the game and go. You know, I was up and down all the time, so people think I still could do that at, at, at 52. So um, no, no, uh, I would definitely not. Uh, apart from playing with my mates here with a veterans game, I mean, which is at a walking pace, so I enjoy that because it's the banter. But I, I couldn't play, I couldn't play regular, no chance. Umar online is now starting a hashtag bring back Fox. So, <laughs> <it's>, uh, <laughs> um, bring back in what capacity though? <laughs> uh, Glenn says, not sure if this question was asked because I was late to the party. Really enjoy, really enjoying. Really speaks well. What manager would he like to play under and who is the right man for the tune job of the takeover happens? Well, we've answered the question about yeah. who he'd like to play for, which was Klopp. Yeah. If, you know, if you if the, if it goes through and Steve Bruce does move on, you know, what which manager would you like to see come in? What 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 who is who's it first first and foremost, who's available? Well, anybody's available if they've got the money. I suppose you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're getting linked. We're getting linked a lot with Rafa, of course, in the return of Rafa because he has unfinished business. Um, we've been linked with Allegri. We've been linked with um, uh, Pochettino. He seems to be one of the favorite yeah, yeah, around. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I know Moreno's at Spurs, but you know Moreno as well has got a connection with the northeast through his relationship with Bobby Robson, and he always said that he'd love. You know, there's an opportunity love to come and Newcastle. So, you know, you could pick anybody, of course. Yeah, I, I think the first two. I think uh, Rafa and Pochettino. I think the, whichever one you get there, you know, you've got a good manager. I don't think anyone yeah. would begrudge any of them to come in. So, instead of having a long list of if spots and maybes, the two who are probably available now, I, I would go for any of them too. Yeah, good stuff. So, where can people find out about your your fit camps, etc.? Obviously, they need to be down Norwich way to, to go. Your yeah, camps, well, so where... well, it's, it's in it switch. I do it in it switch at the moment because we're on lockdown. I've been quite fortunate that I've been doing it live online, so I do it yeah. my boot camp is online. But um, I'm based in it switch, um, which is where I was born and bred. So I'm back here. Um, my mum, my mum is here. So I'm with this Corona thing going on. I'm a carer for my mum at the moment, um, but the the main part I do it here is at, a, uh, at an old football club called Whitton United, which is a football club where I started at as a youngster and got spotted. So I've still got great ties with them. I'm a homely boy. I like to, you know, I like to keep my feet on the ground. So uh, my boot camp is set up here in Ipswich still. Yeah, good stuff. And it's, uh, you just find out online. Obviously, you can add you on Instagram if you yeah. can find out that there, um, mate. Yeah, Any definitely. Last, uh, last minute? last message for the Newcastle fans mate before we, uh, we say um, goodbye no really just just keep patient I mean it looks like something's going to happen we're all praying we're all we're all yeah, staying patient and hoping that this takeover takes place but at the same time you know this don't also does not get carried away because we know that at the end of the day that we've been through these heartaches before with Newcastle but the main thing for us is to get this takeover done and dusted to everyone stay safe and healthy to get the football back first and foremost. And when that is back, then hopefully we'll be in a better place with a takeover and owners who understand the club and understand the sort of football or, or the sort of uh, place they want to be in the league and then take it from there and get the right manager in with the right plans and start building from there. Yeah. Old Grey says, I've enjoyed this. Foxy keeps uh, it really me too, pal. And he says he's an excellent trainer and mate. There, I've said it. That's from old Grey, your mate down there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Such... <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back to your patio, mate. Chris Little says you better get back to work now. Everybody's <laughs> saying they've had a good Enjoyed the chat, though, mate. It was great to hear from you. No, any time, pal. You take care of yourself, everybody, and stay safe. Take care, take care mate. pal. Bye-bye. Take Bye. it easy, mate. Bye. Great to have Rule on. Uh, absolutely fantastic guy. Lovely lad. Loves coming back up to Newcastle as well. And of course, when we when we get back to doing events, we will have uh, Rule back up to Newcastle for the Newcastle Legends event at the Time Theatre. Um, right, guys, I'm going to uh, have to try and sort out a guest for tomorrow. Of course, Saturday at three o'clock in the afternoon, we'll have Lee Clark back on. Uh, Sunday night, uh, well, uh, Sunday, sorry, Sunday afternoon, we've got Ian Barnes from the Long Sands with some uh, some some chat about uh, the potential comeback of the band. Um, but yeah, I'll try and sort one out for tomorrow, and uh, I'll advertise on on my Instagram page. Thanks for watching, guys. Good, uh, see you. Have a good day. Bye bye. Um.